Well, good evening, each one. We welcome you to our midweek prayer and Bible study here at Open Bible Baptist Church. We know that we are broadcasting over the internet uh, during this time, and we trust that the Lord will bless you as you tune in and have a time in the Word of God and a time of prayer together. We're going to begin with singing, and uh, it's wonderful to be able to sing together. And so we're going to begin with a wonderful hymn that we know very well, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Holy, Holy, Holy. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. bow together for a word of prayer tonight. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee tonight for the privilege of gathering in this way. We thank you, Lord, that you are holy. We thank you, Lord, that you are set apart from all. And Father, we pray that as we come into thy presence, we thank you for our Savior, the Lord Jesus. We pray, Father, you would meet with us in a very special way, that you would minister to each one of our hearts as you see fit. We thank you, Lord, for what you have accomplished for us on the cross by sending your son. We thank you, Lord, for our risen savior. We thank thee, Lord, that you desire to work in our lives even tonight. We pray, Father, that you would help each home and each family, each person listening in. We pray, Lord, that as you see each one's need, that you would meet that need in a very special way. We pray, Father, that you would be with those that are going through times of difficulty. We ask, Father, that you would give strength and give healing, give help, Lord, we thank you that we can call upon thee. We ask that you would lead our time again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're going to turn to another song, and it is uh, the hymn, Grace Greater Than All Our Sin, and we can be thankful for the wonderful grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount have poured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, 
God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin, sin and despair. In the soul with infinite loss, grace that is greater, yes, grace untold, points to the refuge, the mighty cross. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Dark is the state that we cannot hide. What can I to wash it away. Look, there is flowing a crimson tide. Then snow you may be today. sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Romans 5, verse 20. The last several Wednesday evenings, we have been journeying through Psalm 86 as we've been focusing on one of the many prayers of David. And as we uh, continue here, I just did something funny. And when you have a computer, sometimes things go funny. And so uh, we'll get back to where we need to be here. One thing about the X button, if you hit the X button, all of a sudden things just disappear on you. Let me just pause my video here for a second. Here we go. Okay, we're back here. So uh, we've been looking at Psalm 86, and I trust that this psalm has been an encouragement to you as you continue to look to the Lord and trust Him in these days and in these hours. I would like for us to focus in our attention on a number, another theme that's found in Scripture, and it's a theme of sanctification. Sanctification. And the word for sanctification is another word that we use oftentimes for holy, or to be set apart, to be set apart from sin onto God. And I want to explore with you in the Bible what it talks about in relation to sanctification, or to be set apart for the Lord. I trust that through this study uh, that this will be a time for us as believers to be encouraged, 
that we would be reminded that we're to be set apart for the master's use. And as a result, we will uh, find the help and enablement that the Lord has for each one of us as we serve him. Now, a good theme verse that would uh, that we could use for this study is found over in 1 Peter chapter 3. So I'll invite your attention to 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to look at verse number 15. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 15. The scripture says, But sanctify, or set apart, the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, thank you tonight for this study in your word. We pray, Father, you would encourage each one as we gather together around your holy and inspired word. We thank you, Lord, that your word is alive. Your word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. We thank you, Lord, that you want to speak to us, even our very hearts and souls tonight. And so we pray your blessing in this study in Jesus' name. Amen. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. I remember this is one of the verses that we was grilled into our minds when I was going through in uh, Bible school. And uh, that was one of the memory verses that we had. And so this is a very good memory verse for us to have as Christians. And having the Lord set apart in our hearts for the purpose that we may be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And, and it was the call to be a witness and that we can be a witness for the Lord. We ought to be ready to be a witness for the Lord. And it, and it comes from having our hearts separated onto him. I want us then to focus on this word sanctification and, and holiness. And oftentimes when we think of the word holy, our minds think about God because he is holy. We think about the Godhead, all three members of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are holy. They are three and yet one, and they are set apart from all created beings. The Godhead is absolutely perfect in character, in conduct, in everything that God is and who he is. He's absolutely perfect. And there's a couple of verses I want us to focus in on. And uh, if you go back to the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 20. Leviticus chapter 20, and notice what it says in verse number 26. And you'll find that the book of Leviticus is a book that you'll find the word sanctify quite a bit. It's a, it's a book of holiness. It points us to God's holiness and how we can come into a relationship with him, how uh, the children of Israel could come into a relationship with him in the Old Testament, how they could worship him. There was, a, there was a specific way they were to approach God. And so um, we're reminded in Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 26. And the scripture says, And ye shall be holy unto me, for I the Lord am holy, and have severed you from other people, that ye should be mine. And the Lord's speaking to his people, and he says, I am holy, he says. And he says, Ye shall be holy unto me. You will be set apart for my purpose, for my plan. And so it is true for the believer that the Lord has a purpose and plan for us, that we're set apart unto him, that we aren't Israel, but we are the church. And as the church and the body of Christ, we're set apart unto the Lord. Notice what it says in 1 Samuel chapter 2. Just to head a little bit further in the Old Testament. 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse number 2 says, I'll read verse 1. It says, And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord. For there is none beside thee. Neither is there any rock like our God. What a marvelous verse that is as we think of it. There is none holy as the Lord. There is no one beside thee, Lord. There is no other rock like our God. And so what an encouraging, that's, one of, that's Hannah's prayer. She prayed unto the Lord. And as we pray unto the Lord, we can pray things like that. We can pray back the very attributes of God and who he is and what he has done. Look at Isaiah chapter 6. 
Isaiah chapter 6 is another example of speaking of the holiness of God. Verse number 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings, and with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. What did, what did one cry to the other? Holy, holy, holy. They cried holiness unto the Lord. In the presence of God as Isaiah is given this vision of the Lord in, his, in, the, uh, in the very presence of the Lord. Chapter 57 of Isaiah. Chapter 57 and verse number 15 says this. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones whose name is holy. We serve the God of heaven tonight who is absolutely holy. If there has been a time in our lives when we've repented of our sin, that means we've invited the Lord Jesus to come into our heart, turning from our sin, believing upon the Lord, to save us, believing that his death on the cross was for my sins, that he was, he, he bled and died and was buried and rose on the third day. And by faith, I invite him into my heart to be my savior. It's an amazing thought for us as a believer that the very same God who in the Old Testament speak, it's spoken of as holiness and that man could not just approach God in any way. What an amazing thought it is tonight to know and what an amazing truth to know that the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God, lives inside of us as a believer. We know Jesus as our Savior. He lives inside of us. The very same God has made a way for us to have communion, have fellowship, have access onto him, and it's all through the blood of the Lord Jesus and what he's accomplished for us on the cross. And so we have holy God living in sinful bodies as ours. And we can be thankful that he lives in us and he wants to shine through us and allow us to be a light for him until he comes or calls us home. Now, the Bible is clear when it comes to our sanctification through salvation. And there's often what I call the three aspects or what is called the three aspects of sanctification. We know the truth that I am saved. And that, that's the positional sanctification. I am sealed onto the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit of God who lives in me. And uh, we are eternally set apart onto the Lord. We can never lose our salvation. And when Jesus spoke of the doctrine of salvation, he spoke of it not as a temporary thing, but a very permanent thing that we can never lose what we have in Christ. We're eternally saved. And Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand, the Lord Jesus says. And then, so that's when we think about salvation, when we receive Jesus as my Savior, we can say, I am saved. But then we can also saved, uh, we can say that we're, we're saved from the penalty of sin. But we're also saved in relation to, uh, in a progressive sense, our progressive sanctification, that we could say that uh, I am being saved, in which we are continually being delivered from those things in our lives that would turn us away from the Lord. The Lord, with his infinite power and strength, desires to help us through this life. And this is the practical outworking of our walk with the Lord. We call this progressive sanctification. And that's primarily what we're going to be studying as we go through this small series on uh, the believer's sanctification. We're going to be thinking about the practical outworking of that. But then there is the, the perfect aspect of our sanctification, or in its complete sense, in which one day we're going to be removed from this very present world of sin and our old bodies of sin, and we're going to be forever with the Lord. And so um, another encouraging way to present all this truth is that I have been saved from the penalty of sin. I am being saved from the power of sin. And one day I'm going to be saved from the very presence of sin. And uh, I am eternally saved. And so I trust we can all say tonight that I've been saved from the penalty of sin. 
and that when we think of doctrine, the doctrine such as hell, that is something we'll only ever read about and warn people about, warn souls about, and that we will never be found there because we know Jesus Christ as our Savior. We're eternally secure in him. And it's our prayer that as the gospel goes out, many more would, would hear the message of Jesus, that he loves us, that he gave himself for us, and that he invites the whole world, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, then we ask the question, what should our focus be on as we move forward through this life as those who are set apart, consecrated for the Lord? Um, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, it says. Well, we have a number of commands we find in Scripture, and I just want to focus on one command tonight that we find, and that is the command, and it's a very foundational, we could say a fundamental command for a believer, and that is to confess our sins. Confess our sins. We know this is perhaps a, one of the most basic of teachings, but if we get this wrong as a Christian, there is no hope of us truly being what God desires for us to be as believers. If we get this wrong as a Christian and we allow sin to build up in our lives, yes, we will be in heaven someday because we've invited Christ to be our Savior. But we will fail in the joy of our salvation. We will fail in the purpose and the will that God has for us until the time that he calls us home. I want us to notice a couple of verses then again. Let's go back to Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs chapter 28. We always turn to the Bible. The Bible is the answer. The Bible is our authority. And notice what it says, Proverbs chapter 28 and verse number 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. You know, this is the first part of this verse. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper. The covering of sins, this is exactly what the devil is looking for us to do in our lives today. Now, speaking to Christians, this is exactly what the devil wants us to do. He wants us to cover our sins. And when we have sin covered in our lives, we may be able to go through some motions. But the, the real problem is going to be on the inside of us. And there's wisdom here that teaches us when confession and forsaking that sin happens, it says, those individuals shall have mercy. We shall find mercy. And there is mercy for us. The Lord has mercy for us. He has grace, grace greater than all of our sin. And as Christians, we will sin, we will stumble, we will fall. And the Bible is full of examples of Christians who have stumbled, Christians who have gone into various sins, and we're all, we all have temptations in different areas. But the thing of it is, when we sin, we aren't to cover it, but we are to confess it and forsake it. And as we think about that, there's an illustration that we could use. We could use many illustrations, but the Lord Jesus gives us a beautiful illustration here. If you go over to John's Gospel, chapter 15. What will this look like in the believer's life? A believer who has um, desired to put a covering over our sin. We know we can't hide anything from God, but sometimes we can kind of boggle things down and we can uh, even try to hide it from ourselves, hide it from others. John chapter 15 and verse number one, the Lord Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. The picture that we find here is that of the vine and the branches. 
Jesus says, abide in me. We are to abide in the vine. Why? When we fail to abide in the vine, when we allow the covering of sin to take place in our lives, there will be the hindrance of fruit. It says, He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. And oh, how Satan is so pleased today to see Christians that are not abiding as we ought to be in the Lord. We aren't drawing from his strength. We're not drawing from his power. We're not trusting in him. We haven't confessed our sins. We haven't forsaken those sins. We've allowed things to just kind of go as they are. And how glad Satan is to see so many Christians that are just stumbling spiritually and just uh, going through the motions of life without the joy of our salvation, without the true power that the Lord has for each and every one of us. We can all be guilty of this at different times, but the remedy is so very simple. And we're going to talk about that. What then are some principles that can help us in this area? We, we know the Bible is clear. Jesus says we have to abide in him. Abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, it accept it, abide in the vine. No more can ye accept ye abide in me. It's God's purpose and plan for us to be bearing fruit in our lives. So if we're not, there needs to be a self-examination that takes place. And what are some helpful principles that can be need needful for us in relation to this then? We talk about confession. Our confession of sin. When we talk about confession, we, we aren't talking about uh, going to a, a minister or a pastor or anyone to be able to confess our sins to. As a Christian, when we know Jesus Christ is our personal Savior, we have direct access into the very presence of God. We have uh, an immediate audience with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and we can praise the Lord for that. But we can just come before him. We can come broken. We can come rejoicing in what he has done. We can come with thankful hearts, but we ought to be coming with confession. And when we talk about confession, when we sin, the Bible says we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and our confession needs to be immediate. We shouldn't wait until Saturday or, or shouldn't wait until, uh, you know, the end of the day. Um, I remember as a child, Saturday night was the night that, well, we always had a big bath because then, you know, Sunday was coming. And oftentimes it'd be all the, the dirt, especially of Saturdays for us children outside most of the day. School during the week and Saturdays, we'd be able to play out a lot. But we shouldn't be like that in the sense that we just try to, by Saturday, try to get all clean spiritually so we'll be ready for Sunday. No, it should be an immediate thing in our lives. We should be in tune with the Lord. And so that when we sin, yes, we come immediately. We want to confess that. We want to forsake that. We want to turn. We want to keep moving in our lives with the Lord. Another thing about confession is that it needs to be complete. And one person has put it this way. We shouldn't ask forgiveness for, the, for stealing a rope and, and fail to mention the horse that we stole on the end of the rope. And we know that we can't hide our sin from God. He knows all. He sees it anyway. He knows it before we, he knows our sin before we even bring our confession to him. But he calls us to come. He calls us to speak it. Make it known. And there's a reality in that as we make it known. We, we uh, speak the sin that we have committed. And uh, when we think about that, confession ought to be specific. Whether it was a lie, we say, Lord, I lied. Maybe it was selfishness or maybe it was anger that was pent up and just overflowed in our lives. Or maybe we just had it boiling in our hearts and it's on the inside. Maybe it's an unforgiving spirit. spirit. Maybe it's a, a lust after something that the Lord would not have us uh, have in our lives. And, and uh, covetousness, all these kinds of sins that are listed in the Bible. Let's just look for a moment. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 20 says, But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, 
which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. That was our old man. That's the old nature. We're to put him off and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that ye may put on the new man, which is after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying and speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor with working with his hands. The thing which is good and that he might have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace to the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away with you with all malice. Be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. When we confess our sins, there are a great many sins that we can commit in the run of a day. May the Lord help us to be sensitive about it when we sin that we would call upon him, we'd ask forgiveness. We'd seek to forsake that sin. Something else about confession is that it ought to be heartfelt. Not that we just kind of tie in uh, to, the, uh, to our prayer before we go to bed and please forgive me for my sins today. In Jesus' name, amen. And how many times we fail in that area. I failed in that area. Proverbs or Psalm 32 the sincere heart, the heartfelt prayer. Psalm 32 says this, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer, Selah. I liken the fourth verse to that when we cover our sin. When I kept silence. And that's what happens in our lives when we keep silence. Then notice the joy of verse 5. The relief that comes. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgression unto the Lord. And thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. David rejoices that there's forgiveness that's found. And we can rejoice as a believer. There's forgiveness. We ought to come with a heartfelt confession. We ought to come very specifically as we pray. Um, uh, we ought to be coming uh, with the, the complete sin that we have committed And we ought to come immediately before the Lord, not allowing things to um, get in the way of our walk and seeking that confession. It says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. We praise the Lord for that. And notice the second part of this verse. This is the promise that he gives us, not only to forgive us those things we know of and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That wonderful cleansing that he brings in our lives and those even things we, we don't even know that we committed. How good our Lord is to us. Hebrews chapter 10. And verse 15 says. Wherefore the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us for after that he had said before. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. And their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. And I'm thankful for verses like, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our tr transgressions uh, from us. And so are we, do we have the Lord sanctified in our hearts? Is he set apart and is he holy unto, are we desiring to be holy unto the Lord, set apart unto him, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. I trust as we continue this study 
in God's word that it, we will be encouraged in these areas of sanctification. We talk about Christian growth. Confession needs to happen in our lives, and may the Lord burden us about it this week as we uh, continue on. And uh, we thank the Lord for his word tonight, and we're going to uh, continue with a time of prayer together. And we trust that the Lord will bless our time as we close our service, and I'm thankful for each one that's uh, had the opportunity to tune in, and it's been a encouraging and I've been getting lots of different uh, notes and messages from different ones and I've been reading and trying to to if I if you see a little like beside what you've posted it means I've I've heard it and I'm thankful and uh, we just trust that as the Lord sees us forward that um, we'll be able to meet publicly again soon we're looking forward to that time and let's bow together then in a word of prayer and we'll close our time off this Wednesday evening Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the privilege of prayer. We thank you for our Savior who loved us. He gave himself for us. And Father, we thank you. He wants to work in us. We thank you, Father. He's going to come again for us. And Father, what joy there is in our hearts that we're looking forward and we're preparing for the day when we see Jesus, our Savior, face to face. Father, we lift up tonight before you those that have been going through difficulties. We know the, the church has been faced with a great uh, burden of not being able to meet publicly. And Lord, we pray that you would comfort each heart, help each home. And Father, may it be that when the doors are able to be open again, we would just flock together and be so excited to be together publicly. But we thank you for the blessing of this ministry until that time comes. Father, we pray for those in Nova Scotia tonight who are still, of course, going through the great shock of what has happened with the crimes that have taken place there. We pray, Father, that you would comfort hearts, that you would strengthen each home, that, Father, as a result of what has been a tremendous tragedy, Lord, that many would turn to Christ and be saved. We pray, Father, for those that have lost loved ones. We pray, Father, we think that they've lost family members, they've lost uh, a spouse, they've lost a parent. And Father, all of the connections and relatives. And Father, we just pray that you would help and give strength. Father, we pray for the other situation that's been ongoing is the, the virus that has been spreading. And we thank you for the the relief that has been happening now is the numbers have been going down. Lord, we pray that your your will would be done. We, we know, Father, that ultimately this is in your control and your hands. And so we give it up to thee, Lord. We pray for those that are sick. We pray, Lord, you'd strengthen them and help them through this hour. We pray for those in nursing homes, Lord, that are missing loved ones. We pray for um, lonely hearts at this time. We look forward for those restrictions when they'll be lifted and we'll be able to gather together again. We pray, Father, as well for the situation that has arisen in Fort McMurray with the floods. We pray, Father, that you would help those that are in that area. We pray for their safety. We pray your protection upon them and we pray, Father, that you would, uh, that in your will, these flood waters would recede that they would push away from the houses and that they go back to the river and the river would be opened. And Father, it has affected so many. And with all of the social distancing that's required, it's hard for people to work together to put the sandbag walls up and the hospital that they're trying to protect there. And Lord, you know all these things. And so, Father, we lift them up to you and ask that you would um, give help and direction. We pray, Lord, for our homes. We pray for protection spiritually in our lives, Lord. We pray that you would just continue to oversee and watch in our churches and our families. Father, we thank you for this time of ministry tonight. We pray as the gospel goes forward, many would turn to Christ and be saved before it's too late. We just ask, Lord, you'd part us with thy blessing. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you. Take care, each one, and we'll see you, Lord willing, on the Lord's Day, just in a couple of days away. Okay, bye-bye.